Paul. Yes. Uh huh. I decided to change location so that I could uh, get out of the sun. It was getting warm over there. <laughs> See this moral duress, undue influence imposed by one person upon another, taking advantage of the other person's distress or weakness? Yes. <laughs> moral evidence, a type of evidence that tends to support the truth or facts without actually establishing these with certainty? <laughs> moral fraud, deceit that involves a wrong of a moral nature? <laughs> Moral law, the law that deals with matters of conscience and concepts of proper and acceptable behavior. <laughs> Moral obligation, a duty arising from conscious rather than from an existing law which would force a certain obligation to be fulfilled. Yes. Moral turpitude, <clears throat> an offense or a crime that is not only illegal but demonstrates one's baseness, <laughs> depravity, and lack of acceptable standards of social behavior. <laughs> then there's the moratorium, a suspension of legal obligations and debts. <laughs> a delay granted in meeting one's debts, usually because of a crisis situation. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> For example, a debtor may be desperately sick and therefore be granted a moratorium until he recovers and is able to handle his affairs again. Yes. <laughs> then there's that morgue, a building in which unidentified bodies are held until family or friends come to identify and claim them. Oh. <laughs> And then there's these uh, mortgages, yes, mortgage derivatives, oh, in investments that are highly risky bets on the direction of future interest rates, yes. <laughs> now, let's say that you decided that I'm not going to have my rights enforced, and you have the moral evidence that there's forgeries of the ex-officio superior court clerk, yes. <laughs> it's a disease, uh, deceit that involves a wrong of a moral nature, the moral fraud, yes, <laughs> of arresting me for a protection order where you know it's not the signature. Oh, <laughs> the law that deals with matters of conscience, <laughs> concepts and proper and acceptable behavior. <laughs> now, I would say that this moral obligation, a duty arising from the uh, spoken and superior court clerk yes, uh, that exists in law would force a certain obligation to be fulfilled. It violates the whole idea of getting a writ of con uh, garnishment and where you allow one spouse to say, well, I just got a teaching job and I got five sons and <laughs> I just don't have it. It's a financial hardship. Oh. See, I mentioned the financial hardship of having two mental health evaluations yesterday. Yes. Mm-hmm. That it cost me all five dollars and fifty cents, and I spent two hours trying to get three dollars yesterday. Oh. <laughs> now this moral turpitude on the part of the judiciary for continuing to enforce a protection order where it's not the signature of the ex-officio superior court clerk. <laughs> the moral turpitude of the dissolution of marriage, where I was not given any of the actual documents that was admitted to the court or the dissolution of marriage. Yes. And then the moral turpitude and the moral fraud for allowing for any spouse to divorce another spouse without completely divulging any and all cases involving both parties. Ouch! Now, let's say there was a moratorium. I decided that I wanted to contact my creditors, and I explained, well, I'm homeless. I don't have a job right now. I can't make any payments. Could you just wait another six months until I get a job? And they're like, sure. Thanks for contacting us, because most creditors want their money. <coughs> but knowing what I know about the credit industry, I realized that there was no need to contact any creditor until they get that first garnishment of of my wages or my spouse's wages that would have reset the whole six years. So then after I was employed, ooch, look at child support, just called. Now, there's what's known as a morgue, yes, a building in which unidentified bodies are held until family or friends come to identify and claim them. Could you get me every death certificate? Mm-hmm for the last 25 years, and then every writ of garnishment and the actual credit reports of all of those that are deceased. <laughs> I remember when my father, Paul Douglas Budnick, had died. Yes. <laughs> well, I went with an attorney firm that uh, George Sinclair had recommended. Fooch, and uh, was, well, Lyle was the first name of the individual. <laughs> Well, as that young man that was going to Northwest University between my associate's degree and my bachelor's degree, yes, I went to each and every creditor and I explained, well, my dad died and I'd like you to just write off this as uh, no longer being uh, claimable against the estate. Pooch. You know what that attorney did? Mm -hmm. He arranged for some shark financing. <laughs> you ever gotten one? Well, 
let's say you need to borrow a little money to do a remodel on a house that you inherited from your father that had died. Yes, a lot of these loan sharks, they'll call, they'll, they'll charge you 10% a month. Yes, well, he'd come charge me 10% a year. I had no credit myself. I was going to higher education. <laughs> well, what happened was I went to visit with the attorney's office, and he said, well, we're going to probate the estate and close the estate down. And <laughs> I said, well, I went to each and every creditor that my father had had and asked them to give me a letter saying they were no longer going to make a claim against the estate because I was the executor of the estate. Yeah. Now, I was somewhat persuasive at 25, 26 years old. I didn't look like I do now. <laughs> well, what happened was all of them agreed that one-legged biker died in his sleep. I wasn't there at that time. Nobody actually told me about it until it was, I was staying at Danny and Leonard's, uh, Danny and Leonard Rankin's apartment. Yes. <laughs> well, that attorney, what he did was he, he, he looked at me like, you mean they are there are no creditor claims against the estate? Yes. He had an additional thousand dollars to his bill, the motherfucker. Pooch. What are you gonna say? Okay. <laughs> You're the attorney. You can add all the fees and <laughs> Well, he arranged some some financing for some of those professionals in Auburn, Washington to <laughs> lend me six thousand dollars. <laughs> I did a little customization of the house. I wrote scripture all over every wall. <laughs> I didn't put up new sheetrock. I put up this uh, quarter-inch paneling. Yes, didn't really work like I thought it would, but I learned a lot. Yes, he did. I took out the kitchen cabinets. They were steel kitchen cabinets. <laughs> Bought myself some of that spray paint that has, has, has a spackling effect. Yes, paint the whole motherfucker. <laughs> You know, it took me about three, four months. My sister Susan Bowers had helped me during that time and put it back together and I arranged for a renter. Pooh, Katie, Katie McPherson? No, Katie McKenzie. <laughs> if you Google my name, she was looking for me. Oh, you poor child. Pooh. Well, she was moved in there with one of these mentally ill individuals. <laughs> Got paid $1,300 a month for a piece of shit house that I did the remodel myself, but I didn't do it according to really anybody. <laughs> I put anything. <laughs> now I know about these fucking attorneys okay I know about them <laughs> why don't you get me all the dead in the morgues I like to go through all the individuals that sign in every death certificate <laughs> you haven't been using any body parts like you used to do have you Pucci, you've been harvesting some organs <laughs> <laughs> a lot of your clones there, they, they got kidney failure. Think, well, the guy just died, cut it out, put it in me. It's no big deal. I'm a clone. I don't really give a fuck. <laughs>